Hi, Bob. How are you? Good morning, George. Well, it's good morning for me. Good evening, George. Yes, yes. Good, uh, uh, good morning to you. <laughs> Uh, I'm so glad, Bob, uh, that you can have, you, you can find time to join the Training Master Series uh, 50. And the Training Master Series is really a very new program in China. Our tendency, our purpose to build a linkage between the great minds, masterminds in learning development field mm -hmm. and the learning and development professionals over in China because a lot of us are growing. So uh, I'm so glad to have you here. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes, let me start, uh, Bob. With, with uh, uh, we 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 got an hour to uh, to 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 chat. And uh, as you know, that uh, I attended your your class in 1999. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's a proud certificate. I attended your class in 19, November 1999, uh, just after I write, I got my uh, master's degree in instructional design and uh, HRD and uh, performance improvement. So. Uh, and, and, and your class did left, really left a good uh, mark on my career. I, so, so, you know, I, as you can see that all these materials and, and leaflets and that I never materials, I, I, I moved among, I mean, between America and China, moved 10 times my home and I never lost them. So <laughs> it's my professional base, you know, is uh, psychologically. So. Oh, That's so wonderful. first of all, thank you to be my part of my career growth during the past 20, 30 years. And, and uh, so uh, all of us regard you as the masters in TTT in the world. And uh, we let, let, let's start from small. Where did you start? Where, where, we, where did you grow up and where did you go to college? What's your major in college? And uh, how did you get into TTT? Tell us something. <laughs> When and, and how? We're, okay. we're interested. Well, I, I grew up in Chicago. And uh, then I went to the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. And uh, I was there for two years and uh, did very well. But I discovered over the course of that two years that while I wanted to lead and influence people, uh, I didn't necessarily want to do it in a military way. And so I resigned from the academy and I went back to Chicago to a school called Moody Bible Institute. And I uh, got a degree in pastoral training and counseling and I became a pastor. So I was pastoring a church north of Chicago for $60 a month, which at the time was not very much money. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of three years, I was just going deeper and deeper in debt every month. And uh, the, the Bible says that uh, as followers of Christ, we should have a good report with people, uh, right. both those within the church and those outside the church. And if you're not paying your bills, you don't have a very good report. And I've always been a problem solver. So got a problem? I'll solve it right now. So... At my age now, I have a lot more patience, but and I didn't have very much patience then. And so a friend of mine said, well, here's this company and they sell sales training and management development programs. And once you've sold it, you got to do the delivery. And I thought, well, I've got a lot of experience as a pastor. Before being a pastor, I actually won the Illinois State Oration Contest when I was like 13 years old. So, so I was a good speaker, a good preacher, and uh, I taught great Sunday school classes. And so I thought, well, this would, be, this would be great. So I started selling sales training and management development programs where once I sold it, I got to do the delivery. And in that six months, I only made $150 in commissions. And the reason was that when you're a pastor, you give things away. So for example, I say, can I pray for you, George? And you say, well, no, thank you. I don't try five more times to get you to allow me to pray for you. I mean, I'm not trying to close the prayer sale. Um, I just, you know, I just go on my way. Well, in sales, once you have presented an offer, you need to overcome objections, do those kinds of things. And, and uh, so it was kind of counter to all of my programming. And so after six months, I said, okay, either I have to quit and admit that I'm not cut out for this, or I need to change. 
And Maxwell Maltz had written a book in 1967 called Psycho-Cybernetics. And in his book, he said that it takes 21 days to replace one attitude or habit of thought with another. And so I thought, well, he says 21 days. I'm going to give it 30 days because I, I really need all the help I can get. And so I decided for those 30 days, I was going to practice what I call the three Bs. Verbalize, visualize, vitalize. So verbalize, I used affirmations. Today it's called self-talk, but I used affirmations like, I am a master salesman. And I have to admit that when I first said that, it came out more like, I am a master salesman. Because $150 in six months doesn't exactly prove that. But you have to see yourself doing something before you can do it. You've got to see yourself achieving before you can achieve it. So the first was, uh, I used affirmations. Second, uh, so that's verbalize, visualize. So before I went into each presentation, I would just do a five minute rehearsal. I would close my eyes and visualize. I'm sharing ideas with you. You're asking questions, you're responding, you're connecting. Uh, now it's time for the close. And uh, I just saw myself being successful at that. And then the third was vitalize. And so I was very good at getting appointments. And the interesting thing was that I had all the skills. I had been going to all of this sales training and we would do these competitions for all of these skills. And in the sales training, I would win every single one of them. I mean, I was better than people 10, 20 years older than me. But when it came to applying it in real life, that fear of rejection was just there. And so I thought, I'm this week, I'm gonna make 12 presentations. And on at least nine of those, I'm going to force myself, even if it doesn't feel right, to close five times, to ask for the order five times. And uh, so in that month, I made a little over $1,100 in commissions. And within a year, I was making over $8,000 a year in commissions. Now, when you go back to 1968, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And, uh, and as a result, I was also doing a lot of training. So ultimately, I was asked to move from Chicago to Denver and head up a new master training academy that we're putting together. And I actually designed a three-week intensive training program that uh, equipped other distributors for how do you succeed in doing this as a business. And and I was pretty successful at it, both from the standpoint that I knew the content, but I also knew virtually every way to fail because I had personally done it. And so uh, I had a lot of credibility in saying, you know, here's, here's how you do this, uh, not because of the theory, uh, but because I've actually made it work for me. So that was actually how I started in the training field. Great, great. So after that, uh, what, uh, what's, uh, that's, that's really a great story, uh, great story. I never know, I know, you know, I know you so many years and never ask, and I'm so glad to take this opportunity to, to, to ask you how did you start it in training. And uh, so after that, you never stopped, right? No, as a matter of fact, I was with that company five years and I ended up with nine promotions, I ended up as senior vice president of marketing. Mm -hmm. And then I left that company and I joined a company in Minneapolis. So I was still in Denver, Colorado, okay. but they had a program called Adventures and Attitudes. And it was a 30 hour program on human relations, communications, purpose in life, problem solving. And, uh, and in four months, I did 10% of their total annual volume. And so they asked me to move from Denver to Minneapolis to help build the company. So I, I did that, which is how I ended up in Minneapolis. Right. I double sales every year for seven years. Wow. And then I uh, discovered that some promises that have been made to me about, well, we really can't pay you what you're worth right now, but when the, when the company is successful, you know, we're gonna remember and so I was the third largest shareholder, but the uh, president and chairman had like 85% of the stock. 
and uh, and so they just they just refused. It's like, oh, I I don't remember ever saying anything like that, and I had nothing in writing, and so I thought I could be bitter or I could do something else, and so I had spent. Uh, a lot of time in creating training programs for the company. So I thought, well, I'm just going to go off and, uh, and do my own thing. And so the interesting thing was that I had worked a lot on this whole participant centered thing. And, and about that same time, about 1980, I was on the national board or the international board of the American society for training development, what we now call ATD, the association for talent development. Right. So chapters were asking, well, would you come and, and speak to our chapter as, as a board member? But what I discovered was that they really weren't interested in knowing what's going on at ASTD. Their members wanted meat and potatoes. You know, what, what are some practical, relevant, useful things that I can do to be a better trainer tomorrow? And so what I did is I kind of extracted things that had worked very well for me. And I, and I called it originally creative learning, uh, creative training techniques. Right. And, uh, and since I sold the Bob Pike group in 2013 and I can't use that anymore, I now call it results-based creative learning strategies. So I still have the rights to use the content from my 30 books. And so, uh, so I did a session for them on, uh, so I'll, I'll use the new, new name, results-based creative learning strategies. And the room just lit up like a candle. Um, it's like, wow, what, what great ideas because people are so ingrained with lecture. And in those days, we were still using overhead. So it was called foil and toil. Throw a transparency on, talk about it. Throw another transparency on, talk about it. You know, um, then we got... Uh, then we got 35 millimeter carousels and we're clicking through all of these uh, slides, you know, and, and we still do death by PowerPoint. We don't engage people. And, and so basically it was originally 17 ways to engage people. And today I've got 61 ways to avoid lecture and really engage people in the learning process. And, and so then that really turned into uh, uh, I spoke at the 1978 uh, ASTD conference. I think it was in Austin, Texas. And they gave me a room for 180 people. We had 300 people in the room. That They, they weren't as concerned about fire marshals in those days. And, and we still had like 80 people standing outside. So they came to me and said, well, would you repeat the session? And so that's where that really kind of took off and that became a one day program and then it became a two day program. And uh, so now there are over 150,000 trainers in, on five continents that have gone through a two day version of that. And that, that's what you went through in 1999. Right, right, exactly. Thank you. Wow, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, sometimes uh, you have you become, you know, uh, well known, famous, and suddenly, like you become popular, very well known. You're widely reported, but as I can see, that that's built upon a lot of diligence and hard work, endurance, and you know, uh, hard working during the past, you know, ten years. And and uh, you have done certainly have done that in sales, and then you achieve that like overnight, but. Nothing come, you know, there's no free lunch. Uh, it was an overnight success in 10 years. Yes, of course. Well, and, 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 and let me say that you, you've got a later question on, on what do we as Chinese trainers do in this pandemic situation. And let me answer that question now because I people may not get to the end of this interview. I have always believed that if you took away everything from me, but if I had my knowledge, my skills, and my attitudes, I could have everything back. Great people will always find a place to apply their professional knowledge and skills. It's the marginal people who are trying to escape by that should be very afraid in these times. Because if I'm adding value and making a difference, and that's the, that's the thing that I want to talk to trainers about all the time. How do I add value and make a difference? 
I want to get results from my training. The purpose of training is to get results. It's not to deliver content. And if I'm doing that, if I've, if I've got my knowledge and if I'm increasing my skills and if I keep that positive attitude, uh, I can have it all back. Uh, uh, in 2008, after the financial meltdown, I actually had a general manager that had been running the company and kept a double set of books. And he showed that we were very, very profitable and, uh, and asked for his bonus early, which I gave him with delight. And, and then I paid 401k bonuses to all the employees. And well, then January 1st comes and my controller says, there is no profit. This, this company has lost over $400,000 last year. Um, we're almost bankrupt. And I'm going, well, how could that happen? How, can, how could we have all of this profit three months ago and, and now we've got nothing? And it, and it took about two months of having uh, trusted advisors work with me to kind of dig in and figure out what was going on. Well, I didn't feel like I could take the 401k money back from my employees or anything like that. And, and, and so again, look at knowledge, skills, attitudes. And so my advisor said, look, yours is a brand worth saving. You do something very significant in the world. And my wife said, well, you know, maybe we should just close the company, uh, keep all of the retirement earnings that you've put aside. And, I, and, uh, and she said, but, but I support you. What do you think we should do? And I said, well, look, I've always been a calculated risk taker. I've always been willing to bet on myself. Why? Because I know my knowledge. I know my skills. I know my attitude. But you should talk to the advisors, you know, because this is a big step. It just doesn't affect me. I know that I can always land on my feet, but uh, you've been behind me 100%. And, uh, and they, they, they told her, this is a brand worth saving. So we took literally everything that I had saved for retirement and put it back into the company. But in the next five years, um, we became extremely profitable. And the interesting thing is that I went to the employees and I said, look, I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want to reduce salaries. But, but basically, we have to find a, a way to cut a million dollars of expense out of the company. And I can't do that because I'm not frontline. I don't know everything that's going on. You're the ones that have to do that. Now, if you can do that, and we have seven days to do that before I have to talk to the bank, then um, I don't think we'll have to do any layoffs. And uh, if there are salary reductions, they'll be they're very small. And so we ended up doing like a 10% salary reduction. I took a 50% salary reduction. Um, but in a week, they found a million dollars. Now we were only a $4 million company, 25% bad that it just leaked into the company because I had a general manager I trusted and, and, I, and I wasn't paying attention. But the bottom line is we came back and we came back stronger than ever. But again, it's knowledge, skills, attitudes. When you're delivering something of value to the world, right. um, you will always find a place to serve. Thank you, Bob. That's really good examples and uh, how to provide value. So uh, I also want to ask you, you have been teaching TDT for so many years. Uh, in, in, your, in your view, what are the, some of the basic qualifications to be, to be a trainer? What makes up a trainer? Well, I, I, I think the, the first thing is, is let me differentiate between a trainer and a speaker. Because I think that there are a lot of people that are good speakers that say, I want to train, be a trainer. And then they get in front of 25 people and what they want to do is wow them. And, uh, and I believe the purpose of a trainer is for participants to leave impressed with themselves, not intimidated by the instructor. Excited about what they now know they didn't know before, excited about what they can do, now do that they couldn't do before with more confidence in themselves. Uh, I remember one time we were doing a five-day train the trainer program, one of my trainers and I, and it was all competency-based. So every time we did a segment, people had to go off. They had to do something. They had to demonstrate that they could do it. Uh, we had a big board where people were signing off, off on all these things. 
And at the end of five days, as they were leaving, one person came up to me and said, you know, thank you, Bob. I didn't see you do anything I can't do. And they left and, and my, my trainer said, what an insult. Don't they realize what it took? And I, I go, no, that was not an insult. That was a compliment. We've empowered them, we've equipped them and, and they've got the confidence that they can go out and do everything that we've modeled for them. That's probably one of the best things that anybody can ever say. And so I think that, that that's the biggest thing is that as trainers, uh, we need to be there to serve, that, that I am really here to get you results. And that means as trainers, for example, that a lot of times we need to push back and not do training. I think that a lot of times people make training requests. And I, I wrote an article uh, a number of years ago, and I said, are you a doctor or a drug dealer? And what I mean by that is uh, when you go to a doctor and say, look, uh, I want drugs, the doctor doesn't say, wait a minute, uh, what are your symptoms? Uh, I need to do a a diagnosis, a prognosis, a course of treatment, because prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. Right. Whereas a drug dealer just says, what do you want? Do you have the money to pay? And as long as you've got the money to pay, I'll give you the drugs. And I think that too often as trainers, we're drug dealers because a manager comes and says, my people are really stressed by this pandemic. Give them stress management. And I need to push back as a trainer and saying, okay, well, what's causing them to be stressed? I mean, is it, is it just this pandemic or are there other things? Uh, you know, for example, have you ever had a headache, George? Oh, yeah, I do. Okay, have you ever taken something for it, like aspirin? Or... Oh, yeah. Okay. Chinese. Yeah, all right. So a headache is not a signal from our body that it lacks aspirin. But often what we do is we have a headache and we cover up the symptoms by taking something rather than maybe spending a little time thinking about what's causing this headache. Because if I get rid of the cause, I eliminate the headache forever. And I think that we need to be much more diagnostic in our profession because then we're delivering real results that have real value. And so I think that... Uh, that I, I actually see us as training consultants or actually performance consultants. I, I don't even want to be a training consultant because as soon as you say training consultant, you're saying training is the solution. I'm a performance consultant. And one of the possible solutions to this performance problem may be training, but it may be a systems problem. It may be a policy or a procedure problem. Um, it may be a recruitment problem. It may be a placement problem. Or maybe people just need a little coaching. And none of those things take people away from the job. So if I use all of those things first, then I'm going to get much greater support from management for a training solution because they already see that we've examined the other things. And now training becomes an investment, not a cost. Wow, Bob, that's that's great analogy. Uh, that's a great analogy uh, to compare a speaker uh, to a speaker and trainer and uh, drug dealer and doctor. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because as I, I I I got inspired by your analogy. I think that you know uh, a speaker is just like make you high. I mean, give you some anything as long as you can pay, <laughs> pay attention or pay money, and then I can get you you know, really high, but a doctor really go into uh, after symptoms and then they really go to the real causes and see what's the real cause. What is, is that systematical structure or, 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 or anything else that we can cure? So, so doctors, that's why doctors are doctors. So mm -hmm. thank you for, for the, for the, uh, for the great analogy. That well, you know, actually, actually the interesting thing is that uh, a lot of times I do keynote speeches. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask, who did you have last year? And, and sometimes they won't even remember who they had last year. Um, <laughs> but if they've got the file, they'll say, oh, we had so-and-so. And I say, okay, well, what did they speak on? And they'll look at the file. And I'll say, okay, what are two or three things people are doing differently because of that speech a year ago? 
and they won't be able to remember, you know, everybody felt good and, you know, but no difference. And so I said, okay, so you paid 10, 15, $20,000 for people to feel good for about seven days. So in my keynotes, I actually want to add value and make a difference. So it's going to be interactive. And if you, uh, I think you were at my keynote at, uh, at the Training Magazine China conference a few years ago. In 2016 in Shanghai. Yeah, so, uh, you know, interaction and participation, just because it's a large group doesn't mean you can't get people connecting and talking with one another and uh, action planning and doing those kinds of things so that when they, when they walk out of there, they have a plan for what am I going to do? Now, the difference is in training we're also looking at what's my reinforcement program because the purpose of training is get results. Training is a process, it's not an event. And that process doesn't conclude until we see results in the workplace. So we need to look at how am I preparing that workplace for so that when they get back, what they've learned, they get a chance to use and the environment is supportive for them applying the skills so that the organization is getting the results. Exactly. Uh, thank you. That's 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 really to the point. That's where uh, train, uh, professional training professionals' values are. <clears throat> Talking about skills, uh, Bob. You know, over the years, uh, one skill I learned from your class, actually not from your class per se, from 1999 class, but from one of the uh, ATD sessions at that time was still ASTD. I, I forgot which city it was, or maybe Denver, or maybe Orlando, or maybe somewhere else, or San Diego. But and I attended your session twice. Actually, you have you have two you have you have, you have two sessions. I attended both of them. You're up there, you know, in the front, and you got like 600 people in the large room, mm -hmm. and you know, people were very noisy. And then and then what I I I, I said different positions. First time was left and front left and front right. And what you did was that you asked three from the front row close to you, three people, three people, and you asked them to clap with you. Like if you can hear my voice, clap once. Yes. If clap you can once. hear my voice, clap twice. Yes. If you can hear my voice, clap three times. Three times. And then suddenly, like within five seconds, the entire room is clapping with these three people, just like like waves, like ripples. And then that's okay. great classroom te technique. And I've been using that technique, even though very small, but very effective, very mm -hmm. effective. In my classroom, as for instance, I train like sometimes 50 people and they got very noisy in the, in the you know, interaction. And school practice Absolutely, size. sure. And I just ask them, so if you can hear me once, then claps and clap, clap, clap. And the entire class are quiet down and they're looking at me right away. Yep. So Absolutely. thank you for doing that over the past <laughs> 20 years. I've been using that technique. Oh, and, you're uh, welcome. Yeah. So speak of that. And uh, uh, I learned that there's a 90-28 rule. And mm -hmm. tell us something about it. So that's, a, that, that's very classic of your research. So uh, we know from, uh, actually, I learned the 90 and 20 from Tony Buzon. His research in Use Both Sides of the Brain showed that adults could listen with understanding for 90 minutes, but that it could only listen with retention for 20 minutes. So if, if I'm talking at any given point, people can understand what I'm saying, uh, unless it gets past 90 minutes and then, then they can't focus anymore. But the retention bucket is so much smaller. They can only listen with retention for 20 minutes. So imagine, I've got my 20 minute glass and I've got a 90 minute pitcher and I start pouring and I, I go, wow, this is great. They're understanding, they're really engaged and I keep pouring. Well, you know, pretty soon if I've got a 90 minute pitcher that glass is gonna spill over. They're not gonna continue to absorb. So I need to cut my content into 20 minute chunks and start a new, uh, if you will, round of learning every 20 minutes but then beyond that, uh, what we learn from television is most com commercial television in almost every country I've visited breaks for a commercial and they break for a commercial about every eight minutes. Well, I don't know the statistics globally, but here in the United States, 
the average high school student, when they finish 12 years of school, has been in class 14,000 hours. They have watched 19,000 hours of television. Now, it may not be the same in China, but I'll, but I'll bet that if they're not watching television, they're playing video games. And video games, and, and oh, well, my kids watch video games, but you know, they just play that for hours. No, they don't. They play it for three, four, five, six minutes, and then it levels up. It switches, it breaks, um, and, it, and it forces a, a reconnection. And so even video games are re-engaging people. It's not just a 90-minute game. It's a whole series of three- and four-minute games where you level up, uh, you acquire new skills, you do those kinds of things. And, and so in the face-to-face -face classroom, we need to re-engage people a minimum of every eight minutes. And in the virtual classroom, uh, because right now I'm spending a lot of time working with clients on how do I convert my classroom to virtual? And it's, and it's not simply as simple as sitting in front of a camera and starting your PowerPoint and delivering it just as you would in a the classroom. There are a lot of changes that need to be made, but in the virtual classroom, we're re-engaging people every four minutes uh, because there are more distractions. And, and a lot of times, uh, now if I've got 20 people on, uh, in a Zoom classroom, uh, I can have them with all their cameras on, and, and that's a method of keeping engagement. Um, but I need to re-engage them every four minutes because I don't know what else they might be doing on the side. They might have a second screen and they're answering emails or and they've got their phone and they're using uh, uh, WhatsApp or WeChat or you know who knows what they're doing. So I need to re-engage them every four minutes. So there is an adaptation of your 90, 20, and 8 rule right now because we're all uh, moving online. Just to uh, continue to that topic that uh, you mentioned that during the pandemic, we're full, during the la our last interview during the, uh, you know, the online summit, that you, uh, you, you said clearly that because of the pandemic, a lot of us were forced online. We're forced going online, so we need to adapt. So can you elaborate a little bit about that? Um, well, actually, uh, I actually uh, tell my clients, we need to go through seven steps to adapt online content to the virtual. And, and the, the first is that we, we have to revisit the objectives mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and look at, our, are these objectives valid? Because I think that a lot of times in our face-to-face -face classrooms, we, we have uh, some fluff. And so we need to apply the, the Pareto principle. And you're probably familiar with that. Yeah. Um, an Italian economist uh, named Pareto found that 80% of the value of a company is in 20% of its assets. 80-20 rule. Yes. And then, then later we discovered that 80% of our customer problems come from 20% of our customers. 80% of our sales are made by 20% of the salespeople. Yep. And, and so the first thing I have people look at is what's the most valuable content you have in your face-to-face -face training that should be delivered online? And it's probably not everything. And then secondly, we look at uh, what actually needs to be taught in a community environment and what could be delivered by way of pre-work. So um, I'm taking some of what I used to teach in the classroom and I'm sending out a series of videos for people to watch in advance. And I mentioned to you, uh, yumu.com. So I actually have a virtual uh, seminar starting tomorrow where I'm taking a number of trainers and showing them how to do exactly this. And so I put together a, uh, a micro learning with Yumu where, uh, before they even come to class, they're going online and they're taking a poll so that I know where they are with their experience and all of that. Uh, they've got a pre-reading on virtual training that kind of gives them the basics. And then they uh, create a video, which everybody can respond to. And all of that before we, we show up face-to-face 
uh, tomorrow morning. And then there are other things that will follow up and, and reinforce that so that it'll also continue after learning. So this, the second step is we're breaking our objectives into are these behavioral uh, knowledge-based objectives or are they skill-based objectives to look at what do I actually need to teach online? And the other thing that I tell people is that if you can test it online, you can teach it online. So for example, can I test, and, and I think we talked about this the other day, can you to test swim. somebody's ability to swim? Yes. And no, not, not safely, okay. Right. And uh, so that, that's the second thing that we look at. And th then we look at um, creating a, a, a flow how, uh, in, in chunking it into that uh, basically 90 minutes, but then within that 20 minute segments, and then within that down to four minute segments. And then what kind of activities am I going to put to engage people? Because it shouldn't be four minutes of lecture, then another four minutes of lecture. And so it may be four minutes of lecture, and then it might be a paired share where I put people in breakout rooms. And then they come back and we debrief. And, and then I might give them a, a, a puzzle to do. And so there are all kinds of engagement. And, and we actually have 61 techniques that will work in the virtual environment. So they they go through that. And then we then we look at core, closers, openers, revisitors, energizers. Uh, how often am I going to need to revisit key content? Uh, because we know that we need to revisit key content six times to move it from long-term memory to short-term memory. Uh, and then we also look at the concepts of memory because there are seven ways to remember anything. So we look at can we use graphic organizers? What other ways can we help the content to be sticky uh, for people? And then there's the practice in the virtual environment because it's not simply a matter of getting on camera. There are a lot of tools to use, especially if you're not gonna use a producer and I'm a big believer in using a producer. So, so we look at all of those things as, as well to, uh, to move in that virtual environment with confidence. And the interesting thing is that people are afraid of the, many people, not, not all people, but many people are afraid of the virtual environment because they're not getting that feedback. So even now, um, even though your picture is like right over here, I'm focused on the camera. So I'm, I'm not really getting any reaction from you because I need to be focused on delivering to you and you and you and you and everybody else that might be watching. I'm gonna pause that for just a second. My wife is gonna grab the phone. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, she okay, has to be taken care of. Okay. So I'm gonna just do a pickup from here. So we need to think about um, all of those things and the, the trainer is, is less focused on uh, delivering content in the virtual environment as we are in engaging the participants. And when you engage the participants, they're gonna learn. And uh, I just did a virtual uh, keynote uh, on Saturday. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, Alchemy Lab had, a, uh, had an online conference for like 1500 people that they put together in just three weeks. Wow. And they, they made it free, uh, except we, they asked people to donate to uh, the food bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, so even in that hour, I was engaging people in that keynote. And a lot of the feedback afterwards is I can't believe how you can engage people when you can't see them. Wow. And if I can engage that size group and not be able to see them, what can you do when you got a virtual class of about 20 and most of the time you can put 20 of those uh, videos up on screen. So I, I think the virtual environment, even when the pandemic is over, uh, mm -hmm. I think that there's going to be a lot of value in that virtual environment. So that's probably a new skill set that, that trainers would be uh, well advised to add to their trainer toolkit. So, so you predict that even after the pandemic, the uh, the 
uh, delivery online delivery will be a basic or becoming will become a very important competency or a qualification or even required competency as a trainer. You know, I think so. And, and I think it's because we're finding that it can work. Now, I still don't believe that it, it replaces face-to-face -face because I think that when you do face-to-face -face training, you develop relationships in a different way. Right. And, and so I think that there are a lot of social benefits to face-to-face right. -face training. But I right. do think that we're realizing that we can accomplish a lot with virtual training. And, and right. so I would see that quite a significant portion could end up as a virtual training program, just as we're discovering that I can do a virtual meeting very effectively with six or eight people and discuss, and we don't necessarily need to be around a conference table. In the past, when I was uh, working at IBM, I was in charge of China's training uh, at IBM, a, a global delivery center for, for a couple of years. And my boss gave me the directive is that, George, your online learning should be like our global standards at IBM at that time was 60%. And 40% is, you know, instructor led training, like face to face IOT. Um, so, and then in China, adapted to like flipped around like 60% face to face and then 40%. So, you have been in this industry for so such a long time, you have seen a lot of you know, uh, world changes and so uh, societal changes. And so this pandemic is just one of those great e big events over the past like half a century, you know, uh, world history. So even after this pandemic, do you think, w what's your prediction, the ratio of, of online delivery and face-to-face -face training, will that change to, I mean, compared to before the pandemic? You know, to be honest, I think it's gonna just depend on the country. Uh, because I think that it's it's largely a cultural thing. How mm -hmm. how much do people want to connect with one another? Um, and the more they want to connect, if they're a very social group, then then I think that uh, that the virtual learning, uh, you know, not so much. But right. uh, but I think that a much larger portion because. You said 60% online. I don't think that means that 60% is virtual. I think you're also including e-learning oh, yeah. in that. Uh, and, that that includes uh, asynchronous learning as well, because they're delivered the LMS, you know. Right, yes. So so there's also a big difference between uh, oh, yeah. asynchronous where e-learning, when I'm just learning by myself, right. uh, versus the virtual learning where at least I have um, other people that in some form or fashion, depending on the delivery platform, uh, I can, I can uh, connect with. Uh, because I think that a lot of times, uh, so I'll give you an example. Um, uh, tomorrow when I start my class, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to give people a test on what they should know from the pre-work. Okay. Now, fortunately, they won't be able to see this video in advance or, or I would be giving something away. Um, so they'll each have a test and uh, they'll each be in a separate breakout room. And after about, uh, after about three minutes, I'll say, okay, now I'm gonna pair you up with somebody else and help each other answer the questions. And then after about another two minutes, I'll say, now I'm gonna put you in a group of five and so now what will happen is at the end of about 10 minutes, they'll have all of the answers. But when they first looked at those 20 questions, if all they did was read the pre-work, they probably can't get more than about five or six of the questions. But all of the information is vital as a, as a base to build a course on. Now suddenly when I'm talking with you and it's, Thank goodness, George has some answers I don't. And then between the two of us, as we talk about the ones that we couldn't get, um, you know, suddenly we're getting some clarity. And by the time you do the group of five, they've got like 90% of the answers. Well, that, what they don't realize is that that test was actually a revisit. And, and we revisited several times and now, and each time it became more and more sticky in their minds 
and now we've got a, a baseline that that everybody can move forward from and so suddenly they realize man i i really love having a learning buddy i love having a learning partner um, I, I love getting in a group and and now the learning accelerates because sometimes even if i say what questions do you have mm -hmm. A lot of people's brains freeze, but if I say I'm going to put you in a group of three, you have two minutes to come up with two questions for me. Well, now in the process of talking, we may answer a lot of one another's questions, but now the question or two that we come up with are really, really good questions that are probably going to resonate with the entire group. And, and all because we had a couple of minutes to reflect and talk to one another. That's that's great, great tactic. That's a great, I mean, even the trick to me. I mean, just as a trainer. Uh, okay, I'll I'll keep that secret as a secret until tomorrow. <laughs> until you open your class, do your uh, do your. There you go. Thing. Yes, don't post it on YouTube or Facebook or anything. No, I won't. <laughs> okay. But uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, Bob. You mentioned a very good point that uh, that depends on depends on the country. Uh, and then you you moved uh, to the great training techniques. Uh, but I just want to comment on the training technique. It seems like I've been away from your classroom for too long. <laughs> I need to revisit because I've been doing a lot of training and I need to apply a full, I, I mean, a full bucket of all of their creative training. I mean, no, uh, it's called uh, result-oriented learning. Uh, Results-based creative learning strategies. Creative learning strategies, yes. I, I, I need to relearn that and reskill and upskill myself. There you <laughs> go. There you go. Um, but uh, you just now, uh, you, you just hit a very good point that uh, uh, depends on uh, where it's from country to country. But I believe China and America will be the, among the front runners, you know, among other countries, mm -hmm. you know, people, interconnectivity. And uh, so uh, uh, speaking of uh, cultural differences, I, I also have a question on that. You have, you have worked over in over like 25 countries, more than, more than, more than 25 countries, I believe. Yes. Uh, are there any cultural impacts to be... I mean, to I mean, any any cultural impacts to take a trainer as a profession? Any example? I mean, from country to country, you have seen a lot. Tell us something about about that. Well, you know, the interesting thing is that because everything that I do is based on how the brain works, the Chinese brain, the Japanese brain, the Indian brain, the American brain. The French brain are no different. I mean, if you take it out of our head and put it on the table, you can't say, all right, which is the Chinese brain? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, our brains are all wired the, the same way. We have the neurons, the synapses, all of that. Right. And so as long as I'm brain-based, the principles apply. And, and I'll give you an example. Um, when I, uh, I was going to do a, a global leadership program, for the JCS International, and so they were inviting people from 140 countries, and uh, and they said, okay, well, no, no. Here's what they expect: they expect that you will do a one-hour lecture, and then there will be 20 minutes of Q and A. And I said, okay, well, but that that that's now that's not how I teach. And they go, well, but that that's what they're expecting. And uh, and so I thought, all right, well, I can start with what they expect. And so I, I started with about, uh, ten, oh, and, um, and don't expect many questions during the Q&A time. And, and so I started with about uh, five minutes of lecture. And then I said, um, you know, in the last five minutes, I have uh, presented four key ideas. Turn to a neighbor. Uh, what were those four ideas? And guess what? Everybody turned to a neighbor and they started talking. And I said, okay, well, what was one? What was another? And so now we were revisiting and they didn't even know that uh, I wasn't reviewing. It was revisiting because they were doing it. And then we got about halfway through and I said, okay, uh, I'd like you to get a group of three and come up with uh, a question you'd like to ask me. Now, about 70% of these of the participants of the 140 were from Asian countries. And, and in a lot of Asian countries, um, 
you know, Japan, uh, China, especially, um, it can be considered rude to ask a question of your sensei. You know, you're challenging the teacher if you ask a question. Sometimes, yeah. Yes, okay, but the teacher has now given you a goal. You three people come up with a question. So it's not challenging the teacher. We're actually doing what the teacher asked us to. Right. And so we had like 20 minutes of rapid fire questions. And, and now when somebody's raising their hand, it's not my question. It's my team has this question. And, uh, and what I did is I said, okay, now who wants to ask the first question? Somebody raised their hand and said, great. Now, when I answer your question, you're going to pick the next group that gets to ask a question. And we're going to answer 10 questions. And now people were competing. Oh, we want to be the next one. You know, pick us, pick us. But it wasn't me. So nobody could say that I was avoiding people or that I was favoring people. Um, why? Because the groups were deciding who was going to go next. And then I said, okay, now when we go on break, if you still have a burning question that we didn't get to, uh, over here we have a capture the question board. Just take one of the sticky notes, write your question on it. And uh, during the break, I'll look at it and I'll see if we can work in answers in, in the next segment of the program. So here's a way that even though I was told culturally, you know, group involvement won't work. Well, I'm not gonna lecture on group dynamics. Uh, I'm not gonna lecture on group participation. It, it, uh, people do wanna get involved if they're given a purpose. So, uh, but they have a tendency to think that, oh, involvement is games. And, you know, we're going to play games and games are a waste of time. Not if they see that there's a purpose for everything that you're doing. And when they see that there's a purpose, actually, uh, and, and actually clients are amazed, we can probably take a lecture-based program and reduce the time it takes to deliver it by 30% by putting participation in it. And, and a lot of times people make the argument, well, I can't let people participate because I've got too much time cover. And I say, well, look, is, is the goal covering everything or is the goal building competency so that they're doing things differently when they go back on the job? Right. And the more they participate, the more their skills are going to get built and the easier it is for them to transfer back on the job. Exactly. So, That's, yeah, please. Yeah. So, uh, so I see more similarities um, then I do, then I do differences. Uh, if you're using that participant centered approach, um, and you're, you're honoring people and you're honoring their experience and you're respectful. And, uh, and I tell people one of, one of the things that whenever I go to a new country, I, I ask, you know, so for example, I've been to China probably a dozen times. Right. Um, but if I were going to come and do something with you, I'd, I'd say, okay, George, what are, what are the do's and don'ts? Even, even though I might have heard those a dozen times, right. because then if in the process of our working together or whatever group I'm speaking to, I make a mistake, uh, you know that it's a mistake of the head, not of the heart. Right. Uh, people will forgive a lot if it's, uh, if, if it's just a head thing. But if they think that it's deliberate, um, that it's a heart thing, that you just don't care, um, you know, then I think you're on, on dangerous ground. Right. So even uh, that's between cultures that uh, we need to uh, just to kind of hit, hit back to your point that just uh, even between cultures, it doesn't matter. I mean, what culture we're in, but all delivery are the same. We need to stick to the learning goal or the learning objectives. Do they create value? And then as long as we design well, and then honor their uh, their concerns, and then pull them in. They will participate. They will unleash their potentials. I found that true uh, mm -hmm. among I, I myself participated in many like Korean groups and Japanese groups and uh, and and uh, Vietnamese groups and uh, at, at you know ADD countries. I saw that myself too. I mean, learning everywhere is the same as long as we create value. But is need to Absolutely. be the trainer to be aware of that, right? Mm -hmm. The trainer need to design that, and uh, just uh, also want to check on a smaller point that you mentioned earlier. Uh, that you you said that we chunk into all the videos. Just this is a very quick. 
um, you, you said that we chunk all this information into four minute videos. And when you, when you chunk them into four minute videos, and then uh, uh, I, my question is because we're, you know, the, the, you know, there's a memory model from the 1968. And then um, do we, uh, do you provide those within those four minute videos more microprocess? Do you provide any chances for interactivity? Because I see the interactivity as the process encoding those information into long-term from short-term memory into long-term memory. Do you provide that opportunity of interactivity? Well, it depends on the purpose of the video. So okay. <clears throat> many times I'll have them watch it. So, so for example, um, <clears throat> I've got about a three minute video that shows um, a teaching situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and before we start, I say, okay, and I'm going to show you this video and I want you to get a learning partner and you're going to be either eyes or peas. So eyes, you're going to focus on the instructor as you watch this four minute video. Peas, you're going to focus on the participants as you watch this four minute video. And I want you to see, is, is learning taking place? If it is, how is it taking place? What's the attitude of the participants toward the instructor? What's the attitude of the instructor toward the participants? Look for all of those things. So now let's say I've got 20 people in, in a class, maybe in a virtual class. So we watch that four minute video. And then I say, okay, um, we're gonna have a, a couple of different breakouts depending on, now if it's a face-to-face -face class, I'd say, okay, all of the I's go to that half of the room, all the P's go to that half of the room. Now, if I've got a group of 20, I'm gonna divide them into groups of five. And I say, okay, now compare notes. What did you see? And then when that's done, I merge so that we have half I's, half P's in a group. So they're comparing both sides of that. And, and so then in that process of debriefing, rather than because I, a lot of people show a video and they say, okay, uh, what, what did you think? And, and now it becomes a, a, a dialogue between the instructor and one person as one person after another shares something. This way, everybody is engaged. Right. Now I've got some other videos. So, so for example, I'm using Zoom to teach this course. So I've actually posted 18 four minute Zoom videos on different features of Zoom. Now, I want them to look through those and watch what you think is gonna be relevant because the, the final project you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be delivering some of your content to us. And so, uh, so I want you to look at what tools you need to use. So you may not need to watch all 18 videos. Uh, you pick and choose the ones that help you use the tools that, that you want to use. Or you may understand the tools from our modeling in the class, uh, but you might want to refresh on exactly how does that work. So in that case, it's, it's a matter that it's more of a, a resource or a reference. Uh, it's it's kind of like saying I want to find a YouTube video on how to replace my thermostat. Uh, so it's more of a how-to. And, and I think that how-tos don't need the same kind of encoding. Um, it's it's kind of like Einstein was asked, how many feet in a mile? And he said, I don't know. Yeah. And they go, what? And he goes, but I know where to find it if I need it. Right. So I, I, I think that that's, uh, I, I think that there are probably two uses of video in that. Right. Thank you. That's that's really completely uh, explains that nowadays uh, in recent year, in the past five to seven years in China, micro learning, micro courses has been so popular. Mm -hmm. Micro courses are so popular, like entire country is following that trend. Everybody's up to, you know, micro course. Do you have micro course and that Corbin University? So it's so popular. Suddenly overnight, it's just like bingo. You know, everybody's uh, talking about and learning about uh, how to create it, and, and there are there are courses of how, how to create it, thousands of them. So, um, well, I see it from uh, from a uh, uh, theoretical point of view that if you're, I mean, a lot of those 
micro courses. Uh, let me de let me describe to you. A lot of them are like uh, five to eight, you know, minute videos or PowerPoint recordings, and then they put it online into uh, they leave it in you know LMS. And then they ask the learner, their employees in their company to just, just go ahead and look at it because they have like hundreds of them, even thousands of them. So they're there and they call them micro courses because, but I call them just, you know, EPSS or JITT, you know, just in time training or just electronic, electronic performance support system. Sure. Courses. Yeah, exactly. EPSS. <clears throat> so I, 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 there are information there. They're not going through because most of the viewers they do not provide an opportunity of interactivity for learners to encode to encode those information like through you know uh, repetition to into long term memory. So the, I I just call them information instead of knowledge. So correct me if I'm wrong. Well, you know, I, somebody could argue, well, it's just semantics, it's potato or potato, but I but I think that. Uh, I think that sometimes, uh, I think micro course might be right. Don't call it micro learning. Uh, exactly. Okay, so, um, so I think if you wanna call it micro course, it probably fits. You know, yes. You know, micro learning says that I actually want you to learn something. So, yes. th so this is why I'm using yumu.com um, as uh, because that actually is a is a is a micro learning platform, and uh, so for example, um, for the course I'm doing tomorrow, there are three pieces of pre work. So they go online. The first thing they do is they take a survey. Uh, the second is there's a pre reading that they do, and then when they come into class, that's when I give them the test on the pre reading, which we already talked about. Uh, then the third thing is they they create a video and the video is about uh, when the course is over here's what i here's what i want to be able to do i'm moving into the virtual learning space here's what i need to be able to do and they create this video well when they're done the artificial intelligence built into yumu.com actually gives them a score on their presentation style did did you have good energy did you have eye contact uh, uh, were you sincere, et cetera. But then each of the other participants can also view that video um, and provide feedback. And then I, as the instructor, provide feedback. So before they've even come to class, they've gotten to know every other participant in the class because they've, they've watched that video. And then as we go through the class, they will create other videos that then become a, a basis of micro learning. And as we create whiteboards, we capture those and they've got a, a flip chart tool. So there are actually 17 different things that I can do um, with this micro learning platform tools that I can use. And one of them is flip chart. So I can actually capture each um, whiteboard that's created and I can actually create an audio conversation around um, what's the meaning of this whiteboard? Do you remember when we did this? Have you thought about using that? So, so I can either just put the flip charts there for them to revisit on their own, or I can actually create an audio that kind of digs a little bit deeper uh, into that. So there's a lot of richness to it. And then I can, so for example, when I do Q and A, mm -hmm. um, I can say, uh, Instead of using the, the, the Zoom app, I, I can say go to umu.com, uh, uh, text a question, they type it in, then they see all of the questions coming up and they get to vote on which questions do you like. And then I say, okay, I'll answer the top four now. And between classes, I'll record answers to another five and they'll be available on the app. So, it, so I can control how I do Q&A. So um, I'm, there may be another uh, uh, many apps that do this. I'm not aware of others, but I found that it helps me to do a before, during, and after so that I'm preparing people. Uh, we're engaged in the content and building community, uh, but then there's an after where there continues to be that reinforcement after the 
main content is delivered. That's a great example. I know that uh, uh, the software that, so you're using Zoom and Umu.com, UMU.com, right? Yes. And then you're, you're collaborating those uh, 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 synchronously online. Yes, I, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so to for breakout rooms and sessions for uh, students will go online to, uh, to Umu.com to, for, for interactivity, but uh, for face-to-face -face delivery, you're using Zoom. That's a great example. Yes, great, and, uh, and it's a Chinese company, so obviously it's available in Chinese. Oh yeah, I know. I know the founder. The founder is a good friend, a uh, very good friend of mine, Mr. Lee. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yes. Yes. Don't show. They have been uh, doing a lot of uh, big stands, you know, big, uh, um, um, big stands, uh, ADD sessions, you know, primary, yes. like they have four combined and big shining. Uh, yep. The the giraffe. <laughs> yes. A little antenna on top. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, uh, Bob, you have been uh, you you have you have trained like tens and thousands and students, and uh, you have uh, you have so many students over the past over the past half century. Many of them are very successful. Uh, I'm not. I'm one of your students uh, in the past, and uh, I'm still your student, uh, one of your students right now, and. Uh, and uh, tell us some of the very good uh, examples. They, they grow out of a trainer and then they become a very successful trainer, a master trainer, very successful in their career. So tell us something. I mean, along their growth path, professional growth path, what do you see they have done? They have, what they have been doing to get there? Well, I, I think the one thing is that we need to understand if we're going to be professionals that the learning is never going to stop. Uh, I think that there are some people that they, they learn a few things and then they, then they just want to do those same things for the rest of their lives. Uh, the principles don't change, but how we apply those principles, the technology that we use to implement those principles uh, is going to change. And so we need to adjust, adapt, adopt, and, uh, and always be able to uh, and willing to look for new ways. And uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, <clears throat> that I've always been considered an early adopter. And uh, so for example, uh, I was probably using UMU within uh, seven or eight months of it being developed. I was probably one of the first here in the United States uh, to, to be using it. And I thought, well, this is, you know, this is really cool. And I started exploring it. And then I even wrote a book about it called Bring Your Own Device to Training. Uh, mm -hmm. And I thought, well, now that really flips things because we're trying to get people to not use their cell phone and not look at their tablets and not, right. you know, well, what if we actually wanted them to pick up their smartphone and, and, uh, and, I, and I want you to go to umu.com and I want you to answer this question and uh, and so now I'm using the smartphone to engage people, whether it's virtually or um, or face to face. So I uh, I think that we also have to uh, test things, try things, but also let go of not what's not working. Uh, I, I remember, and and you're probably not old enough to remember this, but. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when the big thing was laser disc. Oh yeah, laser yeah, disc is gonna, laser disc is going to take over all training. Right, and like, right. And, and five years later, laser disc had disappeared. Disappeared. Yeah. Those are big shining. Uh, yes. Just uh, chime in, Bob. Uh, when China, in the early eighties or late uh, early nineties and late eighties, and later those later this is very popular in China because karaoke just became popular and people started to realize, oh, I can karaoke. And those are the high quality sounds because they're laser. Yes, and, and well, it was probably great for karaoke because you could put multiple languages on the same disc, but, uh, you know, but it was also costing $100,000 to develop a learning program. And right. so there weren't a whole lot of companies that could afford to put that much money into it. Plus the other problem, is if your content changes, then that whole program is worthless. You've got to burn a new laser disc. You, uh, laser discs are not editable. 
And, and so here's something that everybody said was a trend, but it actually became a fad. Uh, it, you know, uh, the same thing with, you know, CD-ROM and then we moved to DVD. Well, now everything is digital. And uh, so I think that the thing that we've got to be aware of is that we, we want to learn how to use new tools, but we don't want to get married to those tools because it, it's just that, you know, it's a tool. Uh, my father and grandfather was carpet, were carpenters. I, I was, uh, uh, became a carpenter, worked my way uh, through college, uh, actually as a carpenter. And, okay. and I can tell you that over the last 50 years, mm -hmm. um, there have even been changes in carpentry. Now carpentry probably hadn't changed for 2000 years. Right. Uh, you know, but when I was first a carpenter, when you were going to hang a door, you were actually chiseling out to put the butt plates in and right. doing that. And now everything's a pre-hung door, and, you know, so you're not going to do that anymore. You're just going to slap that uh, door pre-framed right into the opening and, and, and away you go. So technology changes things. Uh, when I was putting on a, a roof, we were, we were still using galvanized nails one at a time. And, and then actually I, I worked in uh, design engineering for a while at Signal Corporation and they, they developed a power nailer. So now you go up on the roof and you go bam, 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 bam. And you know, you can, you can roof like 70% faster. And, and yet people were going, oh, I just like the old thing of one nail at a time. Well, no, you can't do that. There's an economy of of scale and technology can help us to do it better. So I think that those are the kinds of things. And, and that's why I think that associations are, are so important. That, uh, that when you have like-minded people, so, so here in the United States, ATD is big. I know that they've got um, a group in China. I know they've got a group in Japan that when you, get like-minded professionals together that can share ideas. I think your, your training master series is certainly a way to do that. That uh, we're, you know, we're learning from the best. Um, but I think that there's also a, a, a caveat. And I've worked in China enough to know uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, for example, in China, in China, every time I have done a, a public workshop, uh, whoever was promoting it said, we're not letting independent trainers come. Um, if you work for a corporation, we'll let you come. If you work for a, a university, we'll let you come. If you're an independent trainer, we're not gonna let you come. And, and I said, why not? And they said, because next week they'll be delivering your course. And I thought, isn't it, isn't it interesting that, that somebody can go through a course uh, or they read a book and now suddenly they're the train the trainer expert. And, and I think that, that the other thing that we need to be careful of is we need to think about who am I listening to? Uh, have they paid the price that I'm willing to pay? Uh, have they done what I want to do? Um, because it's, it's one thing to say that I can train trainers. It's an, it's another thing to do it well. And, I'll give you an example from here in the United States because I'm, I'm not actually tr trying to bash China, um, but, but I thought it was interesting that they recognized that, 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 that here are people that actually don't really want to add value. They just want to take advantage of an opportunity. Well, we see the same thing here in the United States. I, I sent one of my trainers one time to, to a, a, a program and I said, okay, so, um, you're a nurse educator by profession. So I, I want you to go that way. Uh, and we just want to benchmark. Are there things that we should be learning? So, you know, don't talk about me. Don't talk about our company. You're only there to see what you can learn. So here's a trainer. So she goes to this two-day train the trainer program. And the trainer starts by saying, the best way to involve people is a good lecture. And here are 85 people writing down, good lecture. And a while later, uh, she said, use PowerPoint sparingly and only distracts from what you're saying. You know, and so now, now she's opposed to visuals. And, uh, 
And so I had actually written a book with this trainer on games, uh, getting adults motivated, enthusiastic, and satisfied. And so there is a game section. And so the, uh, the, trainer, uh, some, the trainer said, never use a game when your content is serious. And, and so finally my trainer raised a hand and said, well, could, could you give me an example of when the content would, well, you would never teach uh, AIDS using a game. And, and, and she said, well, I'm a nurse educator and I use a game to teach people about AIDS. And, and she said, well, maybe you can explain to us how you do that. And she said, well, sometimes what you're teaching is so serious that if you can't find a light approach to it, it is just too emotionally charged and draining and, and people can't get the concepts. But, but here are 85 people that went away from this training and, and, and the trainer, uh, my trainer had lunch with her the last day. And she said, well, how'd you become a trainer? She said, well, I'm not. Uh, I'm a speaker. I went to an audition and they hired me and they gave me the, the leader's guide and I just followed the leader's guide. So if there's anything that you're asked that's not in this leader's guide, she doesn't know and she had no life experience in designing, uh, but suddenly she's training trainers. And I think that's just an absolute travesty, but here are 85 people who go back to their companies thinking, I know how to train. And, and I think that's why we need to be discerning. I think that's why your master's uh, interview series is so important because otherwise people just can believe someone if they just state with confidence. The best way to start is using a good lecture. Oh, okay. You know, the person in the front of him said it must be so. Fluffs. Yeah. Fluffs. Yeah. Fluffs and fluffs. Yeah. Yep. So I, I think that those, those would be some caveats that I would have about the future because I think there are going to be a lot of people saying, I can help you do this. And the question is, are they really equipped? Do they have the experience? Do they have the track record to really help me do this? Or is it just a way for them to make another RMB? Absolutely. A lot of uh, trainings that I see at there are just um, marketing pitching, you know, Marketing mm -hmm. pitching for marketing purposes. So they're just pitching and uh, they're just transcending their information or moving their information. They call them information carriers and they're just from moving from uh, move information from one place to another. And, and then they just walk away because it's not learning. It's so as, as I, I said, as, as I just mentioned that in China, a lot of micro courses. I call them uh, micro software packages. So they're not courses even because mm -hmm. they're, they're not, as you said, there's not even learning in it because that's the Chinese and English translation that in Chinese course and learning is probably the same thing, but mm. yeah, but we, we have the same um, yeah, point of view. And uh, so uh, I said, we we getting closer to our one hour limit and, 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 and I want to, I also want to ask you some very important questions. That is, um, um, that is, um, uh, I have a bunch of questions to ask you. You know, <laughs> um, well, we could all this. We could always do this again and do part two. <laughs> yes, we can. We can absolutely in the the fifty uh, the uh, training series, uh, uh, training series, uh, uh, training master series. Uh, we, we we do have fifty people, but uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, how many times we repeat? Thank you for for offering that. And uh, so the question is, um, what are the, some of the, uh, the latest projects or research uh, you have been working on? I know that you like uh, retired or some area, but, but you, you never retire. And uh, at one time uh, when I was uh, attending a session and uh, said that uh, this is, a, I, I don't wanna, but I just wanna mention to our audience that you are so dedicated you dedicated more than half your half of the century of your life to this profession, to TTT, to this one uh, one thing and research and, and and practice. And you have taught. And on one time, I said, I remember, I, I remember the audience and asked you that you had a heart attack. 
in Australia while delivering a course. Was, was that true? And can you tell us about that? And, and, and what are some of the uh, latest projects you have been working on? Okay, well, it is true. And uh, when I was uh, 44 years old, I had a heart attack in Australia and I was actually teaching the course um, to uh, 40 training managers in Australia and I had a heart attack right at the beginning of it. And the, the interesting thing is, <clears throat> so I actually, even though I'm trained in CPR, I didn't know I was having a heart attack. Uh, I had just, I was a marathon runner. I had just run six miles that morning. Um, wow. I came to class. I was training and I had a, a light blue shirt, tie, jacket. And, uh, and about five minutes into the class, I started sweating so profusely that my light blue shirt turned dark blue. And wow. I had water literally running off the cuff, not dripping, running. And uh, so I had the group do an activity and I, and I turned to one of the guys that I was working with and I said, uh, uh, I'm just going to go in the next room and kind of try to figure out what's going on. Well, when I went in the next room, which was where we were going to have lunch, uh, I started feeling chest pain. And so then I thought, well, I'm going to lay down and then that, it'll go away. And the pain got worse. Uh, he came in and I said, uh, I, I think we need to get me to a hospital. And uh, But, uh, okay, here are some activities you can do until I get back. So, oh so even, even in the midst of having a heart attack, I'm yeah. trying to figure out how do we keep the class going? You're giving out assignments. Yes. And uh, so anyway, uh, it turned out that I had a 95% blockage in my left anterior descending artery. And uh, they, they were able to, to clear it. And I, and I did recover. And I, and I actually didn't have any further problems until 2018. Uh, we were getting ready to uh, move from Tempe back to our um, farm in Wisconsin. And I was going to have a hip replacement in the fall. And I went in to see my cardiologist. And he said, uh, well, you haven't had a, an EKG in a while. We should probably check it out. And, and I said, and uh, I, I said, fine. And, and he said, well, you know, there, there, there are some things here that uh, I don't like. And I said, well, you know, let's take care of it as soon as I get back. And he said, no, you're having an angiogram tomorrow. Now, wow. when a cardiologist has time to do a procedure the next day, you, you know it's serious. Oh, yeah. And uh, when I woke up from that procedure, he said, uh, you've got a 95% blockage in all five arteries. He said, if you had, if you had gone back to the farm, you'd, you'd have died. And uh, so we... He said, uh, Dr. Stein is going to come in. They're going to do a double bypass tomorrow. And that was 10 days before the uh, 2018 ATD conference. And uh, so when I was recovering, uh, I said to the doctor, I said, uh, okay, I know I can't go to San Diego, but I said, if I, if I have, would there be any reason why I couldn't present virtually if they would allow that? And uh, he said, look, if you feel up to it, as long as all you do is you, you get up uh, from your chair and you go in and you present and then you go back. And uh, so with ATD's permission, we put together a, a team of people and, uh, and I presented virtually at, uh, at, uh, at that conference. And uh, so um, that was, uh, that was kind of an amazing thing to see all of the, the support and all of the pieces that came together. And it was interesting. I had a couple of people post on LinkedIn and Facebook afterwards that said, I was really disappointed that you weren't here, mm -hmm. but I actually learned more in that hour virtually than I did in any other session in the entire conference. So, um, so that was, uh, that was kind of a nice thing to hear. I, I, I've seen that too uh, on both uh, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So what are the, some of the projects you've been working on lately? Uh, I'll just before you answer the question, you, you've been okay, right, lately? I mean, it's a oh, yes. oh, no. great no, health. I mean. actually, actually, now I'm probably healthier than I've been in 10 years because, uh, you know, probably five years ago, I weighed 289 pounds. Uh, I now weigh 232, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I did have a bout with valley fever, which is uh, something that's endemic to uh, the four-state area around uh, Arizona, but I'm, 
I'm, I'm coming out of that. So I'm, I'm actually feeling stronger and better. And, and the interesting thing was that I actually never planned to retire. So when people thought when I sold the Bob Pike group in 2013, it was so that I could retire and it wasn't. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it was because I had had several people close to me die from cancer and, and uh, I was looking at the idea that I wanted to transition uh, leadership of the company so that the company was sustained even if something were to happen. But I, but I didn't do it with a plan to retire. And the company had other plans. So in 2015, they, uh, they actually fired me. Uh, and I said, okay, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not retiring. So you, you asked about my latest project. So over the last couple of years, I've been taking all of the things that I've done. And uh, so for example, we're now working on, uh, I've done uh, four new books that are in Japanese only. And we're working on a fifth book. So we're taking things that I've done in the past and looking at how does it, how does it fit with the Japanese culture? Because I've got somebody that I've worked with in Japan for 10 years. And uh, so we're looking at, at how do we take all of that content and, and look at is it, is it evergreen or what needs to be done to make it uh, valid today? So even things that I was teaching about webinars 10 years ago, I'm looking at it saying, okay, how does that fit with today's that technology? Because we can do so much more with a webinar today right. uh, than we could 10 years ago. Um, I'm also spending a, a lot more time with this, this whole idea of we need to be uh, performance consultants, not training consultants. Right. And, uh, and we, we hear a lot about, uh, I want a seat at the table. Well, then you need to be a trusted advisor, not a mere provider. So right. how do you become a trusted advisor? And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm also doing some, uh, some group coaching and, and mentoring and, and those kinds of things. So um, I'm, about as, uh, I'm about as busy as I wanna be. So I'm actually last November, I did, uh, I did uh, two two-day seminars in uh, Taiwan and then I went to Japan and I did three one-day seminars and then I went to Beijing and did a two-day seminar and then I went back to Taiwan and did another uh, two-day seminar. So um, I, I, I wouldn't call that retired. So um, you're, you're and, much busier than, 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 the, uh, than, than some of the strong horses in the field now like myself. <laughs> you're much busier. So, uh, but, uh, but I also think that, that um, that the, uh, the process that I developed, this results-based creative learning strategies is a, is a val valuable tool in people's arsenal. And I, and I wanna find more ways to get that, um, that out to people. And, and so for example, I totally, uh, totally updated, uh, it was called the Creative Training Techniques Handbook and the, the third edition, the 2002 edition uh, was actually translated into Chinese. Right. But there's a 2015 edition that I'd really like to work with somebody in China to get that published because it's so much different. So it has virtual training in it, which back in 2002, we weren't talking about that kind of thing. So, um, well, you got me into it. You got me into it. And uh, I have a couple of uh, publishers. Uh, we have been working during the past uh, couple of years and we published some of the books. And, and uh, so Maybe maybe we can we, we we can we can talk about that later. I mean, I yep. I'm very interested. I think I think training tech uh, classroom delivery or online delivery nowadays and those are so important. I mean, to this new era, you know, classroom mm -hmm. delivery, as you said, human social interactivity it can never replace anything. I mean, direct. But right. right now, because of the distance and time and efficiency, everything. So we want more efficiency and a lot of content still. Can be delivered. Can be delivered via in the internet, and that's where the updated version for person is. So absolutely, uh, yeah. And uh, so let me ask you another question, sir. Uh, you have been regarded as the world-renowned TDT master. You have devoted yourself more than half a century. That's a absolute record and credibility. Um, and also a model of somebody, you're somebody up here. That's why we, we want, I want to ask some, you know, your, your past experiences because 
uh, through this interview, I we I we do want to bring you down from the clouds and you know to our Chinese present to, to our Chi young Chinese learning professionals as a human being. And I said, Bob, you know, you're tender, but you're next to us, and even though you're online. So uh, looking back, if you could have done it again, what would you have done differently? A lot. You know, there's probably not much that I would have done differently professionally, except that uh, that in the three, three cases where I trusted people that I shouldn't, um, I should have taken Ronald Reagan's advice, trust but verify. So if I had taken the time to verify, I probably could have saved myself a, self a lot of problems that way. Um, the other thing that I probably would have done differently was, was probably personally, because um, uh, I had some problems in my first marriage. And uh, instead, of, instead of putting more effort into solving those problems, I put more effort into training. And it's like, okay, I'm, I'm not really getting positives here, but when I go deliver a training program, everybody loves me. And, uh, and I probably would have spent more time um, with that personal relationship. And, and even when it ended, I, I uh, was great at supporting my kids financially. And I probably should have fought harder to be in their lives. And, uh, and I didn't. And that, that's, that's my fault. So that's a regret that I would live with. So, so I would say for, for those of you that have a career, um, understand that your family is so important and don't sacrifice your family for the career. I think that it can be both and, but I think that you've got to have that. I, I think that you've got to have that balance. And, uh, and at the, at the end of the day, um, family is what's going to be important to you. So, so don't neglect that. So that would be um, probably my biggest learning that I could share. I really personally thank you, sir, for that great advice. I think that's advice to all of us because right now there's so much pressure because the Chinese economy and, and you know growth and everybody's looking to, to grow fast and faster uh, than competitors in the marketplace. Everybody got a lot on their shoulders, a lot of lo heavy loads mm -hmm. um, on their shoulders. And we see a lot of even, you know, some tragedies that we, we never wanted to see among the young you know, workers, not only in the learning and, and, and development community, but also uh, as, a, as a whole, you know, the, gen, the Gen Y generation and Gen X generation. So, but thank you. That's really good advice. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll spread that idea. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a great advice to thank you. young people, even like in their thirties and in their you know, late twenties and they're just beginning their kids basically mm -hmm. and um so they, they have a they, they have a lot ahead of them so yeah, absolutely yeah and uh i know that we're closing to our one hour actually we are a little bit over but uh that's a great conversation sir uh but last question as a closing comment anything that you want to any advice to the chinese learning and development professionals or any other important things or questions or points that I didn't ask anything? Well, you know, I think we covered a lot of it in this uh, session. I, I guess the, uh, uh, we, we talked about networking earlier and uh, organizations like ATD or the networking that uh, the training magazine can provide and that kind of thing. But I would also maybe encourage you to form your own little mastermind group. Um, a, a group of two, three, four trainers that have a passion for learning that can encourage and support one another on perhaps a more uh, personal level that, uh, uh, that, can, uh, that can also see you through tough times when they come. So uh, that, that, would be, uh, that would be the other thing. Great, great, thank you, sir. Um, so based on our rough calculation, statistics in China, there are about 
at least 20 million L&D professionals. 20 million, just, wow. you know, that's a small number. Because, you know, taking, uh, because the country's the Statistic Bureau is saying there are like 70 million companies and uh, we take half, half of them away, you know, half of them away. And then, you know, because they're small, mini, mini mom and pa shops and they don't have a training function, uh, corner stores and they don't have, um, you know, they can't afford a training function. But, um, and then we, we cut on, we, we slice another half off. And then at least there are 20 million companies that are big enough, they're at least SMEs, small and medium sized enterprises. And they can't afford a, a position as a training liaison or 30% of their roles and responsibilities are training or coordination or coordinator. And some of the big mega companies like State Grid, like Senopac, and you know, all those big companies, they have like thousands of trainers, one company. So at least the number is, I mean, by our best guesstimate, 20 million. So there's huge marketplace there. Yes, and absolutely. right now, yeah, and now China is, I mean, even though China has opened 40 years, opening up and reform, you probably remember that, you know, when we visit the United States. And, and now last year was the 40 years anniversary of China's opening up and, and reform. But the China's training profession has just started like picked up the speed like during the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very short time period compared to other developed countries. And, uh, and, 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 and most more, unfortunately, there isn't such a profession. I mean, there's such a, such a field of study in higher educations, in higher education. That's the, that's the truth. That's, that's the fact today. So what advice do you have, especially to the young learning development professionals today in China, you know, we're growing so fast, but there's no higher education or somebody doing research on the behind on, on the back, like instructional design, like training delivery on something like that. So what would you do? I guess my answer would be how good is your English? Uh, because I've got 30 books in English on the, uh, on the training and, all of them. <laughs> and, and performance <laughs> improvement field. Yes. Um, and uh, so, so that might, uh, you know, and, and I would say that, uh, you know, if you've got the opportunity, so, I'm not sure um, how soon I'll be back in, in, uh, in China. I'm, I, I know that I'm going back to Taiwan. I'm actually doing a virtual course uh, to Taiwan next week. Uh -huh. um, but uh, the results-based creative learning strategies would, would be a good base for, for anyone to, to give them the fundamentals. Um, but I also think that, uh, that what you're doing with the master series, is, uh, is, a, is a very good place for people to get solid content because if each of the interviews you're doing is like this one, uh, there have right. got to be at least 15 or 20 usable nuggets in this one hour conversation that we've had. If people, so, so don't just watch it once, just watch it again and see what else is there uh, that I can learn. And you know, the interesting thing is that when you got your degree from St. Cloud, um, you know, it's only been in the last 20 or 30 years that there have been degree programs in the United States. So when I started, there was no such thing as a degree in, in training and development. Um, you know, about the closest you could get was uh, industrial engineering. And so, um, so I think that uh, uh, it, it's unfortunate that, uh, that that development hasn't caught up in, uh, in China, but maybe there's an opportunity to, to develop that, uh, that kind of curriculum. Yeah, just kind of an update you, sir. We, we, are, we, we started to do that because a group of us, uh, 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 re, what do we call in Chinese, returnees, uh, we studied uh, learning development in the United States and worked there and then got some experience and returned to China. We're forming a group to kind of just uh, start it on our own because Structurally, that's very different. I mean, I mean, very, very difficult if you start systematic from through the higher education. But we're starting from because we're starting from the bottom up. Uh, we're we're taking that's the approach that we're taking because 
the what we say is in China, the people mo- the need training most of the training professionals, actually. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So just uh, that, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, that concludes our interview. Um, thank you again. Thank you again. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And George. I hope that we, I, and I hope we'll, we'll have you back again on the stream pretty soon. I hope so as well. That will bring us to the end of the Bob Pike interview. How do you feel? I feel great. I think Bob is a great guy. Looking back, looking at the entire history of his career, he's been doing great. He's really one of the living masters among us. He's truly one of the greatest masters in this field. Next week, we're going to have James Kirkpatrick, Dr. James Kirkpatrick. We call him Jim. He is one of the greatest masters in this field, too. He's the sole heir to the Kirkpatrick training evaluation model, the four level model. In Chinese, we call it Ke Shi Si Ji, and he is the sole heir. Ta shi wei yi de chuan ren. So, next Wednesday, Let's see what Jim got to say. So see you next Wednesday and good night.